Evolution involves more than the survival of the fittest. It's also about the survival of the most cooperative and mutually beneficial relationships are critical to the survival of every species. Welcome to the Symbiotic Podcast, where we will explore the collaborative side of life and work to consciously evolve science itself. Greetings, fellow Homo sapiens, and welcome to the Symbiotic Podcast. I'm Cole Hans, and today I've got three of my colleagues from Penn State here with me to talk about the work that they're doing involving bioprinting. Very exciting episode. Um, first, on my left here, Ibrahim Osbalat is Hart's Family Associate Professor of Engineering, Science, and Mechanics here at Penn State. His major research interest is bioprinting and tissue engineering. Daniel Hayes is an associate professor of biomedical engineering at Penn State with an emphasis on nanomaterials, macromolecules, and composite structures for applications ranging from regenerative medicine to lab-on-a-chip technologies. And finally, we have Dino Ravnik, an associate professor in Penn State's Department of Surgery. He directs the Plastic Surgery Research Laboratory at the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, which focuses on the creation of engineered tissue that is suitable for microsurgical implantation. Welcome, gentlemen, and thanks so much for coming down to be on our podcast today. So, first of all, I'd like to know a little bit about each of you, about your professional background, your research interests, and your expertise, a little deeper than just in your bio. Would somebody like to start on that? Ibrahim? Sure. Uh, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Uh, I also receive a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering uh, with, with specializing uh, in, in uh, manufacturing in general. Uh, but later, uh, uh, with my PhD, I started to work on tissue engineering and, and, and 3D printing together. Uh, so then I uh, uh, established a lab uh, in Iowa. Uh, I was an assistant professor before I started uh, uh, my associate uh, uh, professor faculty position here at, at Penn State. Uh, so there in Iowa, uh, I developed uh, a lab that was uh, focusing on bioprinting. Uh, and then we started to build uh, uh, different tissue bioprinting technologies and we focused on only a few different tissues at the time. So after I moved to Penn State, I expanded the lab significantly. Uh, and now we've been working on various different bioprinting projects uh, and, and we developed uh, uh, about like 10 different tissue types uh, from pancreas to skin uh, to, to bone and, and cartilage. Fantastic. Dan, what about you? Sure. Uh, I'm actually a Penn State grad, so I graduated from Ibrahim's department, Engineering Science and Mechanics. Uh, that's where I got my PhD. Uh, the focus of my work there was largely on nanomaterials and nanomanufacturing. Uh, after that, I moved to Louisiana State University uh, and began working on biomedical applications of nanomaterials, nanofabrication, nanosensors. Um, and then in 2016, I came back to Penn State as a member of the uh, biomedical engineering program. Uh, I also have an appointment in Huck and an appointment in the Material Research Institute. And now we're focused on uh, using spatial and temporal control um, through nanomaterial drug delivery uh, to control differentiation of stem cells to make complex tissues. Fantastic. Thank you. And Dino, the surgeon on the team. Well, I'm also a graduate of Penn State. I finished a, a Penn State general surgery residency program. After that, I completed plastic surgery training at Indiana University and then a reconstructive microsurgery fellowship at Sloan Kettering in New York City. My clinical practice primarily deals with reconstructive um, uh, basically the reconstruction of cancer and traumatic defects across really the entire body. Um, I'm fortunate to have somewhat of a science background. I interrupted my surgical training for some uh, basic science research. And most recently, I also have a, a master's in stem cells and regenerative medicine. Um, and so our lab really looks at um, utilizing human progenitor cells and stem cells for the creation of vascularized tissues. And so it's... It, it, it integrates, I think, pretty well with what these guys are, are doing. Great. Thank you. Wow. You guys do some amazing stuff. So I, I'd like to learn a little bit about the focus of your collaboration and, and what roles you each play. Um, where did it kind of kick off and, and what are you working on? 
So uh, I think we can give a little bit history about how we got together, right? So uh, I joined in 2015 and, and then in 2016, 16. like yep. a year later. And Dino was, was already uh, at Penn State when I came here. So uh, I got uh, an invitation from Dino to give a, a seminar talk in Hershey. Uh, and, uh, and my interest was, was to, you know, uh, bring... Uh, more uh, clinical uh, perspectives into into our research problems. So I have uh, a lot of things that I was interested in translating into clinics, and one of them is interoperative bioprinting that we're gonna we're gonna discuss today a little bit. So uh, in in order to you know realize um, the clinical translation of bioprinting efforts, we definitely need you know surgeons, and we definitely need. You know, people from other disciplines, you know, like Dan in, in drug delivery uh, or, or gene delivery purposes. Uh, so um, I got together with Dino. Uh, we, we talked about how we can, we can work together uh, in creation of uh, tissues and particularly directly repairing uh, defects uh, on the life subject in surgical uh, settings. Uh, and at the time, uh, Dan joined us and then uh, uh, we got together, hey, um, I mean, you're working on gene delivery, uh, which is something that we already had a project uh, with, with the plasmid uh, DNA, uh, right? But he was not really doing plasmid DNA at that time. He was more, uh, more focusing on microRNA technology that he'll describe in details. Uh, and then uh, I see that it's more beneficial and clinically, uh, uh, you know, translatable uh, compared to plasmid DNA technology. And then we, we start to work together. We publish... Uh, you know, articles uh, with with, uh, with Dan's group, with with Dino's group, uh, we share uh, um, uh, you know materials all the time. Uh, I focus more in bioprinting side. Dan is more in in um, uh, in gene um, delivery or or, or 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 gene engineering side. Uh, and Dino is is giving us a lot of idea about the surgical implications. And then he also comes here and participates in in surgeries quite often. Thank you. Do you guys want to chime in a little bit about the collaboration? Uh, sure. So I, Ibrahim did a great job of summing it up. Uh, it, my interest in the collaboration is in developing these complex tissues. And we talk about interoperative printing and making interfaces between bone, uh, adipose, skin. That is right in the area that my, my group is uh, focused in. At, but we don't have any uh, knowledge or access of about 3D printing. So that, that is not a strength of our group. But we do look at the gene regulation and how can we take undifferentiated progenitor cells or stem cells and convince them to become these three or four different types of tissues mm. in close proximity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, complexity in the um, crosstalk between those tissues as they develop. And so how do you get from an undifferentiated mass of cells into three mature tissues in a very, very confined space? And so that's the, and that's one of the nice parts about uh, 3D printing in general, but particularly interoperative printing, is it allows us to take these cells that we've pushed down these differentiation pathways and get them in very close proximity and control where we're putting them, so we can create these uh, types of structures. Yes, and for our listeners, let's define what intraoperative bioprinting is in particular. I I'm going to kick that over to Ibrahim. He's the expert. <laughs> so the uh, the intraoperative bioprinting. Uh, uh, is a process where the bioprinting uh, process is is performed directly on a live subject in a surgical setting. So uh, this was uh, previously done in some extent, not really in, in very deep and extensive uh, uh, manner uh, by a few groups uh, in the world only, and particularly for skin regeneration. Uh, and the process was called uh, in situ bioprinting, and some people call like in vivo bioprinting, but none of these terms uh, could explain the process uh, precisely. And then since we had some clinical translation aims, uh, Dino came uh, out with a very good name, intraoperative bioprinting. Hey, oh, let's your, call you, this. You, you, you I coined so. that phrase. The, the oh, name oh, came yeah. from him. So he's the, uh, he's the father of, of uh, intraoperative bioprinting wow. term, not, not the process, but, but, but the name. Interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, nowadays, uh, we're trying to change uh, uh, the name because uh, I mean people people use uh, in situ in vivo uh, and now we, we, we call it intraoperative interchangeably uh, and hopefully in the next couple of years uh, I mean everybody call that process is intraoperative bioprinting I'll start to catch so on. which is uh, which is you know 3D printing of tissues uh, directly uh, on on a on a uh, you know on an animal in the future on a patient 
uh, to repair the defects. Got it. Wow. I didn't realize that this team had, or that a member of your team had coined that phrase. Very cool. Um, Dino, would you like to chime in on the collaborative nature of, of, of what it means to you to work with these gentlemen in terms of the work that you're doing? What kind of opportunities arise from that for you? Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, reconstructive surgery is very, very uh, broad, and, and a lot of the solutions are, um, can be suboptimal, and a lot of them require really um, complex reconstruction. So, <clears throat> especially um, when kind of form and function are not optimally restored, you always look for, for better opportunities. And I think the, the one thing with engineered tissues, both you know intraoperative bioprinting and and other ways is really to to bring this to the patient, and and um, I really look at it primarily at the um, at the end level of how we could utilize these tissues, how they could be made you know better um, to be clinically translated. I will say uh, the one thing with you know anytime you're implanting human tissues. We have, um, you really need human materials to start with. So what we've been doing is we've been taking essentially spare parts or excess tissue from our surgical patients that we've been processing to isolate stem cells out of, and then we've been shuffling it to these guys here to do further differentiation, both for printing applications and uh, driving them down differentiation pathways. And so that's something I think, you know, that it would allow the entire process to be basically personalized from both the cell sort, cell sourcing uh, to the um, to the actual um, the bioprinting and application process. Wow, that's fascinating. So I have to ask then, uh, if you get these cells, you kind of harvest these cells from your patients and hand them off to these guys. Then where do you guys pick up? What do you what do you do with those cells when you get them? What does that look like? Uh, so when they come to our group, we look at, uh, as Ibrahim indicated, we look at the genetic regulation. So uh, it's a process called post-transcriptional gene regulation. Mm. If you think about the central dogma of biology, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein, well, that RNA to protein step, we can uh, interfere with the process using interfering RNA uh, and change the expression of the gene. And if we, we've identified a number of pathways that if we push on them in certain ways, we can uh, drive stem cells down differentiation pathways. So they could go down an osteogenic pathway or an adipogenic pathway or an endotheliogenic pathway. And that allows us to control their future fate. Uh, and so that's what we look at. When we get the cells from Dino, we start looking at how we can manipulate them to go down these pathways that we're interested in to create these complex tissues. Amazing. And then, Ibrahim, you, you're trying to put it into the bioprinter? Sure. Is that your... I think I'm, I'm at the last step. Uh, so after the cells are all transfected... Uh, and basically, he defines where these cells should go in terms of the, uh, uh, the final, you know, cell type. Uh, then we, uh, especially by controlling the, uh, you know, uh, locations of these cells, we print them uh, layer by layer into the designated points. Uh, and then uh, they go to the right, uh, you know, uh, formation of right tissue type or the, uh, the targeted tissue type. So in this regard, Dino also participates in the surgeries uh, that we perform uh, here uh, at, the, at the Millennium Science Complex. Uh, so uh, we have other surgeons too who participate in, in surgeries that involves like bone, uh, like Elias Rizik from neurosurgery department. Uh, so sometimes uh, the surgical room uh, in, the, in the animal facility can be quite uh, crowded, uh, right Dino? Uh, like two surgeons, uh, these are really big surgeons, right? So, and then I have like uh, two, three uh, uh, students and, and technician and postdocs, uh, all together like five, six people are working on, uh, on intraoperative bioprinting. And this was would be with rats, mice? Like. So at this point, yeah, we, we perform uh, mainly on rats. Uh, we have other bioprinting work that we worked uh, with, with dance group uh, uh, on mice, nude mice. Uh, so now we actually receive a project from uh, Osteology Foundation from Civizident where uh, uh, we will uh, intraoperatively bioprint the bone uh, on, on sheep. Uh, but that will be performed in Hershey, not, not uh, in, in, in the University Park campus. Wow. Well, what would you say is right kind of at the forefront of what's possible with this technology right now? Would you point to? Do you think it's happening here at Penn State? Are there others uh, internationally that are sort of 
in the ballpark with you? In, in the, the, the area specifically of intraoperative bioprinting? Yes. I, I mean, I, I, Ibrahim would probably know better, but I think we're definitely at the forefront of that field. Uh, I mean, it, it was largely f- created by Ibrahim and Dino. I'm just kind of along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Adding that crucial middle step, you got to differentiate those cells. Man. Yeah, I'll be uh, one of the uh, institutions uh, that is at the forefront of this uh, technology. Uh, as we're doing both on large animal, we're doing more like uh, composite uh, tech tissues, uh, that's not really a single tissue type, but uh, it's quite challenging to make uh, stratified layers of multiple tissues and interfaces. And now uh, the other goal is to uh, to induce some vascularization in them in order to uh, keep the, keep those tissues viable. Uh, but uh, I'm not a surgeon, uh, of course. I mean, uh, we we discuss a lot with Dino and other surgeons and uh, and my students. You know what we should do. Uh, in order to make this process successful. It's not just uh, the technology itself, but there is also uh, a significant biological uh, component of it, right? I mean, printing on the animal doesn't mean that you really make a, a functional tissue, right? So you gotta make sure what you print is gonna turn into a functional tissue that's gonna repair the defected side. If it's a bone, it will be a, a, a solid strong bone that's gonna, uh, if it's for craniofacial defects, right, it's gonna keep the, uh, keep the skull really intact and, and, and strong uh, so that the, the brain won't really get any damage if there is any sort of loading on the, uh, uh, on the skull. Uh, so uh, uh, we discuss a lot uh, about the biology, about the process itself, about the technology, you know, should we do just a, a 3D printing or should we do like a six axis printing where uh, we can drag the print on very complicated surfaces where we don't really have to print, you know, vertically, but it can be, you know, approaching from different angles. Uh, or can we use like a robotic uh, 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 surgical robots that we can put uh, uh, a tip, uh, right, uh, on a surgical robot that the surgical robot can print because the surgical robots have been uh, used in clinics. I mean, Dino can, can tell more about those, right, uh, for, for, for a decade or more, right? Uh, so uh, uh, these are my, uh, of course, uh, my contributions, right? Uh, but we also get a lot of uh, contributions from the surgeons because we don't really know if, if what we propose is going to work or not. But these are the guys that they really know if, if our proposal, proposed technology is going to work uh, on patients. They can take that into yeah. practical reality, right, which is what the collaboration is all about. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. So... A couple things come to mind listening to you speak. Uh, you're talking about vascularization of tissues. I want to make sure we touch on that and why that's important and why that's tricky. And also, you know, the different layers of the different kinds of tissues. Can you speak to, you know, how many different kinds of tissues have you, have you printed? I think I heard something about bone being printed and, and the different kinds of cells. Could I hear a little bit about that? What's been achieved so far that, we're, that we can share with the world? I think uh, what we've worked uh, primarily with Ibrahim, I think, is, um, you know, bone. I think uh, blood cells have been printed. I think skin, we've done some work on. Um, Ibrahim has also done stuff with uh, pancreatic cells, beta cells. Um, what else primarily, Ibrahim? Well, these are the main, the two, main ones. Uh, tissue types that we've been working uh, together. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, in terms of vascularization, uh, one of his... Uh, clinical practice is uh, microsurgery, right? He deals with a lot of, uh, you know, anastomosis related work where he connects like little blood vessels to each other. So he can tell more about uh, why the tissue needs a vascularization. Yes. And, and for our listeners yeah. to sort of defining what vascularization means, we're talking about veins, we're talking about arteries. Is that right in my understanding? Yeah, veins and arteries, and then, you know, primarily embedded kind of at the, the end level of the, uh, of the vascular tree that's supplying the nutrients to the tissue or the capillaries. And so <clears throat> the, um, a lot of the stem cells or progenitor cells that we're able to harvest from human patients, especially under the correct circumstances, they're able actually to, to form capillary sprouts. The only thing is that we need to basically engineer these capillary sprouts so they're part of a contiguous vascular tree that when you implant these structures, they're able to be um, rapidly perfused by the, by the 
by the recipient site. And so I think that's one of the late major limitations still kind of of, of tissue engineering is, is how do you perform this, you know, this um, anastomotic connection. The, the, you know, following implantation, the body will grow <clears throat> blood vessels into the tissue you implant and it will probably grow a little bit quicker if the implanted tissue already has like an inter, in, uh, intertwined vascular tree, but it's still a little bit too slow. So we're trying to figure out ways of how to, how to speed up those vascular connections. The nice thing as far as with, with microsurgery and super microsurgical techniques now, we're actually able to hook up um, vessels that are half a millimeter in size. And so I think the... the um, uh, we don't need to basically integrate the capillary tree with a large vessel. It can be just, you know, you're going from 10 micrometers in size to 500 micrometers in size. And then we actually already have the surgical capability to integrate that. That's fantastic. Uh, one more question in part one here. Um, how new is this whole field of bioprinting? I mean, how far back do we go? I mean, I hear about bioprinting a lot, but I don't have a real strong sense of the timeline. Is when did when did people start messing with printing bio tissue, or printing uh, tissues, etc.? Well, I uh, I think the uh, the foundation of this technology was uh, was basically demonstrated by uh, a scientist uh, called Klebe um, back in uh, eighty nine, where he uh, uh, modified uh, an HP inkjet printer. Uh, into a bioprinter format. At the time, the technology was not really uh, called as bioprinting. So he called the technology as cytoscribing, and he uh, actually printed some proteins, not really cells. So early 2000, uh, uh, Thomas Bolland, uh, now he's currently in Clemson University. Uh, sorry, he was in Clemson University at the time, but, but now he's at the University uh, of Texas at uh, El Paso. And uh, he printed uh, living cells for the first time using inkjet printing technology, the same thing that Klebe did, uh, like modifying in a printer. And then, you know, then he printed living cells. Uh, and it was a time where, you know, people started to print cells, uh, only a few groups, right? So at that time, it was just cell printing. Nowadays, we're doing tissue printing. In the future, uh, we'll call this technology as organ printing um, because we expect that uh, in the next uh, decade or, uh, or, or so, uh, we could be able to create uh, 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 larger organs, like solid organs that are vascularized uh, and that are scalable in size, and then they're uh, surgically relevant uh, in terms of dimensions and function. Uh, we expect that it may not really be a, a fully functional organ, but it will at least meet the, uh, uh, meet the requirement that the body needs. Like uh, if it's a pancreas, for example, that it's one of the tissues that we've, we have been bioprinting. So our goal is to just to make uh, an organ, bioprint an organ uh, that's glucose sensitive and then secrete insulin. Uh, uh, but, but as you know, pancreas has uh, quite, a, a different, uh, quite a bit different functions like uh, endocrine pan pancreas, exocrine pancreas, like, you know, secreting different hormones. But we're just interested in the insulin secretion function of that. So, uh, uh, and there are other organs uh, like, you know, lung, uh, you know, heart, uh, kidney. Uh, these, are, these are some uh, complicated organs, like com com uh, complicated in terms of the, uh, the structure, complicated in terms of the, uh, the biology as well as, uh, as, well as the uh, mechanical function like the heart. Uh, but with the advances uh, in bioprinting, as I mentioned, in the next couple of decades, we'll be able to see some, uh, uh, some tissues and organs, uh, you know, translated into clinics. Fantastic. And I think the one interesting thing may be, especially if you have like the endocrine or the exocrine organs, um, the things that ultimately may be uh, printed may not look exactly like the organs they're intended to replace. And so I think your the goal is probably to restore the function, um, but it, uh, I think for a lot of organs it doesn't necessarily need to be the exact form. And so then that really broadens, you know, how you can tackle, you know, these problems of, of vascularization, you know, implantation sites and, and things like that. So it makes you think of sci-fi. It makes you think of almost like cyborg people, right? With like the whole new organs that didn't even exist before. We're getting to that level. 
Fantastic. I'm Cole Hans. This is the Symbiotic Podcast. We'll be back in just a minute with part two of our conversation. Hey, Symbiotic Podcast listeners. My name is Jenna Spinelli, and I'm part of the team that produces Democracy Works, a podcast from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU that examines what it means to live in a democracy. Each week, we present intelligent and thought-provoking conversations about topics ranging from immigration to impeachment and conspiracy theories to climate change. You can find Democracy Works at democracyworkspodcast.com or by searching Democracy Works in any podcast app. Thank you to Cole and the Symbiotic team for letting us put this ad in their show, and we hope you'll check out Democracy Works. Welcome back to the Symbiotic Podcast. I'm Cole Hans here speaking with three of my colleagues from Penn State about bioprinting. So for part two, I'd like to launch into a topic that we always cover on this podcast, which is the interdisciplinary nature of what you're doing and the transdisciplinary nature of people getting out of their normal box, working together uh, to have a bigger vision to do something they couldn't otherwise accomplish. And we've already touched on that a little bit with the three of you folks in the room today. Who else have you been working with and what are they bringing to bear that um, has an impact on what you're doing here? Sure. So I've been working with uh, uh, various different scientists, uh, you know, both uh, at the University Park campus, uh, Hershey campus at Penn State, as well as other uh, collaborators uh, out of Penn State. Uh, like Jackson Lab, for example, uh, that we uh, we have been working on uh, 3D bioprinting of lung tissue uh, that we are interested in in creating a, a platform technology uh, as, as, a, as a tissue model where uh, we can uh, use that to understand the interactions of the immune cells with the uh, with the bacterial or, or viral infections um, in the lung. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we can't really have access to the human lung um, that we can use uh, as, as a model platform. And animal models, they, uh, they don't really uh, uh, represent the human physiology closely. So in this regard, we need to create like lung models. And, uh, and I'm here to make lung model, but, but uh, of course we need a lot of uh, uh, you know, expertise from different areas. Like uh, the lung biology is, is one of them. Like we have a collaborator from uh, uh, Ohio State University uh, Children's Hospital uh, that he brings a lot of expertise with the lung biology. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit uh, collaborators at Jackson Lab. They're, they're immunologists and uh, they're like T cell expert uh, that really understand uh, what the immune cells uh, do, how they behave. Uh, and we have also people uh, um, uh, that are expert in, in microbiome uh, at Jackson Lab. Uh, the microbiome is, is the you know the bacteria culture uh, in, in in the body. So. Um, other than that, uh, I have collaborators on other projects, uh, like uh, in this uh, uh, new project, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll receive uh, uh, it in the next couple of weeks, uh, funded by NIH, uh, so then it will be uh, you know, fun at that time. So uh, we have, uh, uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, we interoperate the bioprint composite tissues like multiple layers, as, as Dan suggested, right? So that has like soft tissue, that has hard tissue, and that's being done on the current max, uh, maxillofacial uh, region on the body. Uh, so we need a plastic surgeon that's really expert in soft tissue. We have a neurosurgeon, uh, Elias Rizik, um, he's at the neurosurgery department. Uh, his expertise uh, is in the bone uh, uh, regeneration and, and bone surgery. And then we have uh, Tom Sampson, he's an expert. Uh, in chronomaxillofacial uh, surgery, and he's also plastic surgeon, right? You know, uh, so uh, he'll bring a lot of expertise, uh, not just on the on the cranial side, but uh, if we uh, move into other directions where we want to, you know, uh, repair uh, other tissues on the face, uh, I think Tom Sampson is going to contribute uh, significantly. Uh, so these are some people. Of course, we have uh, uh, you know other people that. Uh, uh, Dan and, and uh, Dino, they're working with, right? They can, they can tell more about those people. 
Uh, our group focuses a lot on the uh, obviously the nanoparticle based drug delivery uh, for delivering the the um, tools to regulate things uh, regulate gene expression post translationally, and that is a very materials focused problem. And so we've got collaborators in Jim Adair, uh, Josh Stapleton here at Penn State who help us a lot with both the design and characterization of those particles, uh, making sure that we're making what we're trying to to make and that they behave the way that they're supposed to, uh, so we can deliver the the microRNA mimics uh, to the appropriate tissue types. Um, Beyond that, we also do, we have some collaborators uh, here who help us with the stem cell differentiation work. Uh, so Lance Leanne, uh, who's in the biomedical engineering program, uh, it helps us a lot with the stem cell differentiation. Uh, additionally, we have collaborators who aren't at uh, um, Penn State. So Jeff Gimbel has been a great collaborator for us um, at Tulane University and helped us a lot with uh, mesenchymal stem cell differentiation uh, in, you know, really um, has helped us refine our, our process for controlling that. Terrific. Dino, how about your collaborators? Yeah, I think that's really the the gist of them. I think we've we've touched on on most of them. We have um, some additional folks at uh, at um, at Hershey, where we've collaborated with the OBGYN department to allow us to get even um, umbilical stem cells. So most of the tissue that we retrieve is from adipose tissue. Those are from from our group's practice, but we've also been able to use both the umbilical cord and umbilical cord blood to retrieve those stem cells as well. So that might be a potential in other areas of starting cellular material. And we've worked with with, um, with some of the other um, uh, folks now we've gotten interested in, in additive manufacturing, even to do um, three, uh, 3D printing of not necessarily for biologic processes, but for you know surgical appliances and models and things like that. Interesting. Fantastic. And uh, this very building that we're sitting in right now doing this podcast was designed to kind of bring all these different folks together and give them cutting edge technology that they can share with materials or, or life sciences, et cetera, and, and be able to facilitate these kinds of collaborations. Would you guys care to talk about what it's like to, to work in these kinds of facilities? Does it actually help? Is it, or is it doing what it's supposed to do? I could speak for our work. I mean, it's absolutely enabling. I mean, having access to both uh, the expertise in terms of Josh Stapleton, his team here at uh, Huck and uh, MCL, um, Material Research Institute, uh, but also then the the direct collaborators, uh, having us all in the same space in the same building, having our students be able to cross pollinate. It's been it's been great, and I don't know that it would have happened had we not actually had this convergent science building. The that to you know, to really drive it. And we pretty much don't really go outside of this building except uh, the micro CT uh, uh, scanning work that's being done in Hershey. A collaborator of us, uh, Greg Lewis, uh, in orthopedics department. Uh, so we send the surgical uh, explants like uh, when, when we euthanize the animals, we take the regenerated tissue out and then uh, we ship that to Hershey and then he, he does a micro CD scanning uh, and he sends the results back and uh, that's how we collaborate uh, uh, with, with you know, some other Hershey folks. But, but uh, I can say 99% uh, 90, of the work uh, that's being done uh, in, in our papers are all being done uh, in, in, in this building. So we're not really uh, utilizing um, just more than a couple things uh, outside the outside this building. Good to hear it's doing what it was built to do. So I was curious about what Penn State's contributing to this field that's unique that other institutions aren't really touching in a way that we are. What, what contribution are we making here? Got it. So I, I can't say that anything we're doing is absolutely unique, but I can say that the focus of this collective group on complex tissue regeneration and creating functional tissues and when I say complex tissue regeneration, I mean the tissues that are composed of different cell types, but they're all playing their appropriate functional role, and that we're creating uh, complex tissues through 3D printing and gene regulation that actually function appropriately and have the appropriate structure. So in terms of uh, other uh, strengths that Penn State provides uh, uh, is, uh, is the material science, uh, science that uh, Sometimes uh, when we develop new materials, uh, uh, we are not really super sure about uh, the uh, uh, the quality of what we uh, produce or, or the novelty of what we produce because we are not really material scientists. So uh, we have uh, quite a bit uh, contributions from uh, material scientists at Penn State, and particularly, for example, uh, we have a project on uh, 3D uh, 
printing of biodegradable metals. Uh, that's something new that we're interested in, in you know, 3D printing biodegradable. So the, uh, the, uh, the printed metal, uh, you know, compared to uh, the other metals like, uh, uh, you know, tit uh, titanium or, or uh, you know, other, other like steel-based uh, uh, implants, uh, these biodegradable uh, 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 devices, uh, they don't really stay in the long term. So they dissolve and then they also support the regeneration of the bond, like segmental large-scale load-bearing bonds. So in this regard, uh, we work with uh, um, material scientists that you can't really find, you know, uh, such quality material scientists uh, in other institutions as, as Penn State is, is known with, uh, with its strength in, in, in materials engineering. Uh, so now we're, we're developing new materials, biodegradable metals that can be 3D printed for, for fabrication of uh, biodegradable implants. Oh, fantastic. Do you know what do you see Penn State doing that you don't see elsewhere? Again, I don't like Dan says. I don't think it's it's completely unique, but it certainly helps. I mean, there's only you know 140 medical schools in the United States, and so the ability to have a large scale university with an academic medical center really allows that clinical translation to be easily de developed in both directions, both you know uh, bench to bedside and back and bedside to bench. And I think that's something that that really helps evolve you know the entire the entire field both from a clinical discipline and from a from a research discipline forward right on thank you very much well this is the symbiotic podcast i'm cole hans we're going to take a little break and we'll be back with the third and final part of our conversation stick around at penn state's huck institutes of the life sciences we investigate life from every angle we study life's forms at multiple scales, from nanoparticles to global biomes, and we confront life's challenges across the globe, from the farm to the city to the wild. Welcome to the Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences, collaborative discovery brought to life. Welcome back to the Symbiotic Podcast. I'm Cole Hans here with my colleagues from Penn State talking about bioprinting. So I'm really curious to know, you know, how far off do you think we are from being able to apply these technologies and these techniques to human beings? What, what would it really take to get there? Got it. So it, that's, a, that's a pretty complex question. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it depends upon what the FDA, uh, how the FDA would respond to uh, the use of stem cells and, you know, genetic manipulation of stem cells. And, and so the short answer is we don't really know. Um, because they're not approved yet. Uh, but I'm guessing anywhere from 10 to 15 years, we're gonna start to see this type of technology, stem cell-based technology, manipulated stem cells, uh, finding their way into the clinic. Would you guys agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I think the the biggest um, drawback is now cells really can't be manipulated if they're going to be used for other applications. I think for you know for for engineered tissues though, like clinically, once once kind of the regulatory hurdles are, are cleared, I think the, the probably thinner tissue is probably going to be able to be. Uh, most easily uh, clinically translatable. And again, just because of the more volume of tissue that you have, the more vascular uh, blood flow you require to perfuse it, it's harder to integrate it. And so, you know, a good example would be like skin grafts. Skin grafts, when we implant skin grafts, we don't have to um, uh, basically hook up their, their blood vessels. We just lay the skin graft down um, onto a recipient site, and as long as the, the patient is healthy and the site is, is healthy, it will um, uh, new blood vessels will grow into it. And because it's such not a very large cell mass, most of the skin graft survives. But if you were to try to do that with tissue that's much thicker, then obviously most of the cells would, would not survive. So I think from a clinical perspective, that'll probably be the forefront as far as the, in, in the initial steps of, the, of these uh, you know, emerging technologies. Yeah, I, I actually uh, explained that uh, to my students yesterday in my bioprinting class. So we went through uh, the bioprinted tissue types, you know, from skin to cartilage uh, to pancreas to liver tissues. And then uh, uh, we discussed the possibilities of clinical translation of these tissues. Uh, of course, as Dino mentioned, the tissues that are thin, 
uh, that are avascular, uh, that means uh, without blood vessels, are easy to translate, and particularly uh, connective tissues are, are, are the very first tissues that we'll see in the clinics, like uh, is denomation, uh, you know, skin is one of the uh, first one because it's very thin, it doesn't really have uh, uh, blood vessels that needs to be printed inside. Uh, cartilage is, is the other one because the cartilage doesn't have blood vessels. Uh, I can see like bone is uh, is very well studied and then we have a very good understanding of bone regeneration with the use of bioprinting technology. And um, I can see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, not really super large segmental defects, but, you know, smaller defects could be easily repaired with the 3D uh, bioprinting technology. Uh, of course, there is also the FDA related uh, uh, issues that needs to be overcome, right? Uh, but uh, except the uh, FDA clearance, uh, the major challenge with overall uh, uh, organ printing is, is vascularization, you know, creating uh, multi-scale uh, blood vessels, you know, from arteries and veins to down to capillaries uh, that you can uh, perfuse them uh, uh, and, and, and when you implant them, get, get long-term patency. Uh, I mean, these are some important challenges. At this point, uh, we haven't really uh, seen any uh, large-scale bioprinted uh, organ that has like multiple scale of uh, blood vessels in it uh, that is transplantable. So as soon as we overcome that hurdle, I think we'll see more uh, tissue types in the clinics, but the solid organs like, you know, kidney, uh, say heart, you know, lungs are very complicated in, in uh, you know, in structure and in function. So these are going to take a long time uh, to be seen in the clinics. What advice would you give to other researchers who are thinking about breaking out of their discipline to work either on bioprinting or, or other transdisciplinary projects in terms of the, the special things that you have to do as a researcher to get out of your box and, and kind of play in this transdisciplinary arena? So I, I guess I would say you have to be patient and you have to be comfortable with the fact that you may not be the expert, which you know we've all been trained to become experts in our field. And when you start working in these transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary areas, you find out that often you don't know a whole lot uh, about that interdisciplinary space. I, I've realized that I know very little about, you know, surgical interventions. I know very little about 3D printing, and you know, it, it's humbling at times to, <laughs> to to discover how little you actually know. <laughs> uh, but that that to me, it, it's making yourself comfortable, and or at least getting over being uncomfortable with that, you know, lack of knowledge. And I imagine too, you get to play the other role as well with these brilliant people coming to you, going, "Oh, I had no idea how that worked." Right. So that's got to be a. a kind of a cool feeling too, to be able to educate one another. Yeah, that, that is definitely nice. I mean, sometimes when you, when your colleagues come to you with questions that, you know, you, you take for granted and you're like, oh my gosh, other people don't know this. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Do you know, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I think, I think <clears throat> part of it is, is at least learning a little bit of the other disciplines lingo. And, and I think, you know, at least being able to have some common overlap. Um, and then what, as far as what the, you know, I think the best way is to kind of collaborate together um, because when you toss around the ideas, there's things that you would never think of on your own. And, and they kind of develop spontaneously out, out from there, kind of a crosstalk, I guess, of, of different disciplines. And I think that's, that's um, um, you have the, uh, the ability to be innovative is made much easier when you have other minds kind of chiming in. I think... Uh, most of the bioprinting research nowadays uh, focuses on just printing cells and then doing some very short-term uh, testing that just shows that the cells are viable and then they can be like you know functional a little bit. But in terms of the tissue function, the tissue maturation, uh, there is very very uh, uh, few uh, uh, small focus. In addition, uh, we want to see these tissues are really working in, in the animals. So transplantation of these into animals, you know, small animals and then large animals, and then showing that these tissues are really functional uh, is, a, is a key factor. So that's why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a mechanic, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but nowadays I do just tissue engineering work. Uh, I don't really uh, uh, do, you know, a typical uh, 
uh, mechanical engineering does. Uh, so it's it's a very different field. Uh, but I learn, uh, and in my opinion, in order to be successful in this field, uh, just uh, you know, printing cells, even like printing cells, uh, requires a lot of biological uh, expertise and facilities too. But but even like just printing cells is not really uh, satisfactory at this point. So we want more successful uh, outcomes, and then therefore. Uh, you know, people should train themselves uh, in tissue engineering and sometimes in, in clinical practices too. Like uh, a, friend, a student of mine who is uh, working on intraoperative bioprinting for about five, six years, uh, he actually uh, did a little intern in, in, uh, uh, in Hershey in the hospital. So he got a certificate. So that means he's, he's now, now learning surgical, uh, you know, practices, not really as a surgeon, but at, le at least he has some sort of an understanding. So with that, he, he, he now, uh, he's, he's an electrical, electrical engineer by training, but he, he maintains the animals, he participates in the surgeries, he, he does the medication to animals. So these are very critical for, uh, uh, for the success of our work. So uh, we definitely need, uh, you know, people from different expertises, but sometimes uh, we need to educate ourselves towards like, the transdisciplinary uh, directions. Got it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Well, what's next for you guys when, with the work that you're doing and, and everything, all these papers coming out and, and grant proposals being written and everything? Uh, what, what do you see as kind of next on your agenda? So the next things are uh, more uh, larger uh, projects uh, that is basically uh, 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 done with the contributions of uh, quite a, a big number of people, like more than 20 investigators uh, from various different disciplines uh, and in particularly NIH uh, has uh, you know uniting type of grant uh, NSF has uh, large center grants so here the goal is you know can we bring those center grants at Penn State and particularly you know can we create a, a center here uh, on tissue engineering region medicine and bioprinting biofabrication biomaterials uh, and in the meantime, you know, bring to such larger grants to, to create a, an atmosphere uh, that we can exchange uh, the ideas and, uh, and make uh, all these, not just bioprinting efforts, but, you know, gene therapy, uh, surgical efforts are all successful. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I would, you know, definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, the the nice thing about kind of a, the the approach or the understanding is that ultimately you'll be able to get um, more and more tissues involved um, and more and more applications. And and the interesting thing is, you know, especially with, with stem cells and you're able to really kind of differentiate into multiple cell lines, the comb combinations that you can make is really limitless. Um, you just have to see, you know, what are, what are the best ways to, to integrate it. Hopefully in the future, you know, we'll figure out ways to um, basically integrate these these printed constructs, you know, with the, with the recipient, you know, a vasculature quicker. So I think hopefully um, that will continue to develop. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, I, I, I have very little to add other than say I, I think that definitely what what I see as the future and where my interest is, is that integration of surgical technique and uh, engineering along with the uh, biology to try and make, I mean, to target some, uh, you know, low lying um, uh, fruit and, and try and get tissues developed and make a clinical impact. And, and so, you know, I, as I just said moments ago, we're probably 10 to 15 years out probably from getting some of these things approved, but can we position ourselves so that as these move towards approval, that we're ready to actually take them to the clinic and you know impact people's lives directly. And then the other good thing is Penn State is now hiring you know more faculty. I think some of the directions are like there are new centers on biomedical devices, and you know some departments are hiring uh, faculty that lines up with our interests. Like uh, uh, Amir Sheki, he just joined in chemical engineering department, whose expertise is in hydrogels, you know mainly. Uh, 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 cellulose dry uh, materials uh, for tissue engineering purposes uh, and uh, I hope uh, we'll, we'll hire more people uh, more faculty members uh, that will actually fill the gaps that, that we're, we're, we need now So what about immunology? I mean we hear about bodies rejecting um, uh, 
uh, organs when they're they're transplanted. Uh, sometimes, uh, what does that look like for engineered tissues? How are we addressing that angle? I think it needs to be a little bit, um, you know, uh, regarding this initial cell sourcing. And so there's still some, some questions on, you know, there's some thoughts that some, some, styles, some stem cells are immune privileged, some aren't. And so a better understanding of that will hopefully allow, you know, um, the correct um, tissues to be developed. For example, you know, is it, is it possible to take a skin cell from somebody and reprogram it to an induced pluripotent stem cell, where then you can differentiate into any cell one you want, and then that cell would be have the same genetic background as the person you're ultimately implanting it to. And so then you would think, well, you know, hopefully that would be immune privileged. Hopefully you don't, it wouldn't be rejected. Now, you don't know how it would be transformed if it was, you know, developed in, in vitro for, for a portion or, you know, how it's transfected to be an iPSC cell. Um, but the idea is that if you're able to use the stem cells from the patient that you're ultimately implanting, hopefully though that would be minimized. I see. Yeah. And do we have anybody here at Penn State addressing that specifically from an immunological perspective? So we, we do. Uh, so Lance Leanne, and uh, he's a HUC member in uh, uh, biomedical engineering. He's working on creating uh, universal iPSCs. So uh, it, it, manipulating the cells genetically to make them uh, as uh, tolerable to the largest number of uh, potential patients. Oh, fantastic. And I want to just salute you guys for all the amazing work you're doing. And thank you again for being on the podcast. Best of luck with everything you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.